Hello, you are watching the Light Novel Street video series on the theology of the body. This video is dedicated to audience 18. So we are continuing our examination of original innocence. In this audience, um, JP2 wants to first draw us to kind of his overall theological approach. So Genesis chapter 2, verse 25, states that the first man and first woman were naked without shame. Now, this reveals what JP2 calls the synthetic character of original innocence. And this synthetic character is the theology of original innocence and original justice through uh, the objectivization by metaphysics and metaphysical anthropology. That sounds complicated. So we're going to need to explain that a little bit. So if we recall from before, JP2 has this dialectic between objective and subjective. So if we recall in the second audience, we had JP2's analysis of Genesis chapter one, and this he called the cosmological approach. It was the first creation account, and it describes man's place within the community of being. And it, in a lot of ways, expresses man and creation in terms of metaphysical categories, such as being and existence. And this is kind of a way, this is a way of describing the objective reality of creation. And so this naked without shame, we're going to talk a little bit about in this audience, the synthetic character. In fact, that's the next slide talking about essentially the theology of original innocence as it developed over the centuries in Catholic theology. And so there's a important role to this, to this process of objectivization through describing what is happening theologically in terms of metaphysics and metaphysical anthropology. This is describing the reality of the first man, first woman. But JP2 wants to caution us that this approach doesn't get us to the whole or the entirety of the what we are searching for. What we are searching for is a biblical anthropology. And JP2 has mentioned previously that in order to develop this adequately, we have to begin with experience by taking into account the subjectivity of the human person. So, and JP2 curiously says that this approach through experience and subjectivity, quote, seems closer to the original text, end quote. And he's referring to the Bible in that regard. So subjectivity, we, can't, we cannot pit it against the objective approach because the objective approach is describing the reality of what we are discussing in terms of metaphysics. And you cannot divorce metaphysics from the subjectivity of human person, right? When we talk about man experience and subjectivity that presupposes an objective metaphysics but if you're going to talk about man you can't just talk about him in terms of metaphysical categories alone you have to take into account his subjectivity and that's the method of jp2 with the theology of the body and now i want to mention this term synthetic because normally when you hear synthetic, we think of something like synthetic food coloring, synthetic food flavoring, synthetic clothing, things that are artificial, produced by factories, by man through chemical analyses, et cetera, et cetera. 
And that's not really what we're getting at here when we talk about the synthetic character of original innocence in terms of metaphysics and metaphysical anthropology. And to me, given that we're talking about something synthetic and it's in reference to metaphysics, it actually reminds me of a famous Enlightenment philosopher, Immanuel Kant, and his book, The Critique of Pure Reason because he defines synthetic in terms of logic. It's a philosophical term used in logic. So and this is from the introduction or the fourth section of his introduction. Um, it's the second edition. So those, for those of you that are unaware, the Critique of Pure Reason has two editions and they call them A and B because there's a lot of differences apparently. I have not read them side by side. I've only read the B edition, so I can't comment on differences and commonalities between them, but I'm just gonna mention that there is a bunch of scholarship on that. So in the B edition, we read, quote, either the predicate B belongs to the subject A as somewhat which is contained though convertly in the conception A, or the predicate B lies completely out of the conception A, although it stands in connection with it. In the first instance, I termed the judgment analytical, in the second, synthetical. The former adds in the predicate nothing to the conception of the subject, but only analyze it into its constituent conceptions, which were already thought which were thought already in the subject. The latter add to our conceptions of the subject, a predicate which was not contained in it and which no analysis could have ever discovered therein." End quote. Now, what on earth did I just read? So if you notice I italicized some of the quote. So, Synthetic is referring to a distinction that Kant is making between analytic and synthetic propositions. So a proposition is analytic if the meaning of the predicate belongs within the subject. So for example, if we think about this sentence, all bachelors are unmarried men. So the concept of bachelor is found in the subject of unmarried men, right? So this is a analytic proposition. If on the other hand, I say to use Kant's own example, seven plus five equals 12, Kant says this is a synthetic proposition because the concepts of seven plus five are not contained in equals 12. A more down to earth example would be something like the grass is green. The concept of grass does not necessitate the concept of green, except by the fact that God created grass to be green. He could have created it to be purple if he wanted to. There's nothing about grassness itself that demands the concept of green or green grass. This just happens to be the way God decided to create green grass, I should say, green grass. Jeremy. Yes. A little off topic, but are there any secondary sources you recommend to familiarize ourselves with Kant and his work? Hmm. I think about that. Besides the couple stand books. Oh, yeah. Well, I guess if you want just a basic review, Freda Copleston's um, History of Philosophy will have a good overview. If you're looking for something that's a little bit more in depth, um, there is the, the Hackett edition of the Critique of Pure Reason has a lot of good footnotes and um, annotations and a nice introduction. So if you're going to buy a copy of the Critique of Pure Reason, that would be a good one. Um, are you asking about like metaphysical criticisms of Kant? No, or just what? of what Kant says. 
Okay. Yeah, I think if you just like want to know what like biographies. Okay. I don't know about biography offhand. Sure. But I think probably the first resource I would just recommend someone would be just Copplestone's okay. History of Philosophy. Right. Or even just the Stanford um, Encyclopedia of Philosophy that's online will have a lot of great articles on Kant. Great, I mean, there, thank you. There's a lot of secondary literature out there. Like you have the Cambridge has um, an annotated edition, like a study edition of this book. And there's the Cambridge Companion to Kant. There's, I think, a Cambridge Companion to the Critique of Pure Reason. So there's a lot of material out there. So I guess it just really depends on what is it you're looking for, per se. Okay. Mm -hmm. And Kant is going to show up late in a later audience. For those of you that are unaware, Immanuel Kant is one of the main um, philosophical interlocutors that John Paul II um, debates with in his articles. And I don't mean like actual debates because Kant is dead by the time JP2 <laughs> is alive, but he really worked with Kant's ideas where they were meritorious and where they were defective. And there's a book called Person and Community that has several of what he was essays from the 50s where he is engaging Kant. And the engagement is usually in terms of Immanuel Kant, Max Scheler, and Thomas Aquinas. Those are like the three big philosophical influences he is discussing in the 1950s. Um, did, did you have any other questions? Nope. Mo. No, I don't. Okay. In that case, we are going to move on from Kant. Oh, I guess before we move on from Kant, just why would I bring up Kant with the term synthetic? And it's because Kant famously argued that all propositions in metaphysics are synthetic so when i see synthetic and metaphysics it makes me think of kant's views here especially since what was very familiar with kant's philosophical work all right moving on now spiritualization so when we talk about this we talked about the spiritualization in the previous audience, how the first man, first woman were in a unique state of spiritualization. And this spiritualization of original innocence is different from original sin. And this difference implies that there is going to be a, another composition of what JP2 calls inner forces, that there's a another body-soul relation, that the inner proportion between sensitivity, spirituality, and affectivity is going to be different, and that there's a different degree of inner sensibility towards the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So how man is going to encounter and experience his body before the fall and after the fall are going to be different while there's going to be continuity. You still have the relationship between body and soul. You still have sensitivity, spirituality, effectivity. But how those relate to each other are all going to be fundamentally altered once the first man and woman eat the fruit from the tree of knowledge and good of evil. Now, footnote 29 is important because it gives us some teachings about the first parents. And this comes back to the objective reality concerning the first man, first woman. So the Council of Trent defined de fide, that means the dogma, highest authority in the church, that when Adam sinned, he lost his original holiness and justice. And 
if you look at up the teaching in the Council of Trent, it says it, those who do not believe this, let him be anathema. That means essentially let him be cut off from communion with the church. So you have to believe this if you are going to be Catholic. It's part of the teaching of the church. Real quick. Makes me yeah. wonder who wasn't believing this. Well, you got to remember, Council of Trent, Protestants. Yeah. So a lot of craziness came out. Yeah. At that time. Now, let's see. And part of this teaching of original innocence and holiness and original justice is that the first parents enjoyed what is called integral nature, immunity from concupiscence, ignorance, pain, and death, and a unique happiness. And these gifts were gratuitous and preternatural. And the term preternatural means beyond what is normal or natural. Um, did you have anything to add, Guillermo? Nope. Okay. In that case, we are going to continue on. The ethos of the body. Now, in Matthew 19, verse 4, Christ speaks to the Pharisees and says, have you not read? And this phrase here, have you not read from the beginning, is a command to return to the depth and mystery of creation, to return to the beginning. And this is why in the very first audience, we began by talking about Matthew 19. And how it is Christ telling us you need to go to the beginning if you want to understand the meaning of marriage and divorce. And just to recall that JB2's method is this historical a posteriori to reach the original meaning of the body and grasp the link between it and original innocence through the experience of historical man. So we have two goals. First is understanding this link between original innocence and historical man. And second, to understand the link of original experience to the ethics of the body, to the ethos of the body. So original innocence is going to imply that the spousal meaning of the body is conditioned ethically and constitutes a future ethos of the body. So some concluding remarks. So JP2 has some interesting statements here. And the, the top one I found to be rather striking that God always creates man as male and female. They are always such. So man is always either male or female. God does not create anything else. You're male or female, period. And that itself is a hard teaching for many years today. Especially, yeah. Now, let's see. Genesis 2, verse 24, revealed that the man and woman are created for marriage. But before the first man first woman became husband and wife they came forth from the mystery of creation first as brother and sister in the same humanity i will say in a future audience jp2 is going to analyze the concepts of brother and sister in light of the theology of the body so it may seem weird at first that the first man first woman see each other as brother and sister especially since we're used to saying or talking about the fact that in Genesis 2, they become one flesh. So the, the concept of marriage is there from the beginning. So it, it does seem a little bit strange that we have this terminology of brother and sister before marriage. Now, off and on over the course of these audiences, JP2 keeps warning us about what he's going to talk about in the near future. And here we kind of get another foreshadowing that the cessation of the reciprocal 
this interest, this interested gift of self leads to the recognition of being naked and the introduction of shame within lived experience. So it's supposed to say shame here. I don't know why it doesn't, but I'll just ignore that for now. And I want to quote, make quote here. So again, quote, original innocence manifests and at the same time constitutes the perfect ethos of the gift, end quote. So original innocence is going to be, I guess we can say the model or form for measuring the ethics of gift. Did you have anything you'd like to add, Guillermo? I don't. Okay. Well, you had your chance. I'm going to end this. Thank you for watching our episode. If you've been enjoying our content, please subscribe to our social media and consider making a financial donation. Your financial support goes towards maintaining our website and the purchase of resources so that we can continue providing great content for you. If you check out our website, you will find many articles and our podcasts. Do you have anything you'd like to add about the podcast, Guillermo? Yes, we upload our podcasts on Buzzsprout, and you can listen to us directly on Buzzsprout or use buzzsprout.com to access all the other platforms where you can find us and listen to our podcast. Those platforms include Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify, among many others. Yeah, if you check out the link, lesnovelespreet.com slash subscribe, you will find many, many links to social media and various podcast distribution websites. Um, with that, did you have any last remarks, Guillermo? Just uh, want to ask everyone, uh, as always, to please keep us in your prayers. Yes, please pray for us in our mission. And with that, I'm going to say goodbye. God bless everyone. There we go.